Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Boyer, Brad, and Kevin. Coming up on DTNS, Will Smith is back to tell us what parts he used when he built a new PC from scratch. Plus, Apple's plan to allow sideloading on iOS. And why the young folks these days may not be as tech-savvy as you old-timers assume. And what happens when you assume? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, December 14th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, co-host of Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, Will Smith. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. I assume you're the Will, not the Brad. I, you know, we thought about it. We thought we might mix it up, but we, yeah. I, I did go with the, I am the Will on the, the Brad yeah. and Tech Pod. And we didn't put Will Smith so as to not confuse anyone. Right, uh, that, right. That, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> it's I no mean, one's fault, must I guess. You but... sick of that by yeah. now. Oh, mm. goodness. Some, oh. Sometimes I touch the, touch the, sometimes I have to touch the stove. But for the most part, yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with no more Will Smith jokes. Uh, good. Yes. Uh, we will, we will try to fend, fend them off uh, fast and furious uh, by starting with the quick hits. On Wednesday, Twitter announced it would shut down its newsletter platform at review early next year. Twitter bought Review in early 2021, and initially the company added Review sign-up buttons to Twitter profiles, then rolled out a feature that allowed users to sign up for re Review newsletters directly from tweets. January 18th. I have until January 18th to move off of Review that I just move on. Too. Anyway, while Meta is pulling back on its connectivity efforts around the world, Microsoft is filling the gap. Microsoft announced a partnership with the satellite network operator Viasat to expand its Airband initiative, which works to expand Internet access to rural areas. Airband will use Viasat's network to extend Internet access to 10 million people around the world, including 5 million folks in countries on the continent of Africa. Airband will also provide seed investments for infrastructure projects in Africa as part of a wider goal to connect 250 million people globally by the end of 2025. Security researcher Brian Krebs reported that the user database for the U.S. FBI's InfraGuard program appeared for sale online on December 10th. The program was designed to build information sharing partnerships between the FBI and private firms, including operators of critical infrastructure. Krebs contacted the seller, who said that they obtained access by creating a new InfraGuard account, posing as the CEO of a major U.S. financial corporation. The data set mostly reveals emails and phone numbers, but also allowed for direct messaging other InfraGuard members. Social engineering. <laughs> U.S. Commerce Department placed the Chinese chip maker Yangtze Memory Technologies, or YMTC, on its entity list, along with 30 other additional Chinese companies. <laughs> A lot of folks already on that entity list, Huawei being the most famous. This would bar U.S. firms from selling technology to YMTC without a license. On October 7th, the U.S. placed YMTC on an unverified list of entities that it was unable to conduct end-user checks on to make sure U.S.-based technology wasn't being diverted for military use. So it's an escalation of the list that they're on. In somewhat related news, Nikkei's Deal Street Asia reports that ARM has determined it is not allowed to license its most advanced chip designs to China's Alibaba. Alibaba, of course, uh, it, it's like an alphabet, uh, except in China. Search engines, marketplaces, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and ARM says due to export rules in the UK and US, can't sell its advanced designs to Alibaba. Apple released iOS 16.2, macOS Ventura 13.1, and watchOS 9.2. The iOS update adds Apple Music Sing to the Apple Music app. That's the one that lets you turn down vocals on supported tracks for a karaoke-like experience. Also allows hiding wallpaper and notifications with devices with an always-on display. And the updates also add the freeform digital canvas app to Macs and iOS devices, letting multiple people collaborate in real time, as well as advanced data protection for or iCloud, which expands the data categories protected with end-to-end -end encryption. If your phone can't run iOS 16, Apple pushed the security patches as part of iOS and iPadOS 15.7.2 updates. If your device can run iOS 16, you'll need to update to iOS 16.2 to get those patches. Yep, that's what they've been doing lately. 
All right, let's talk about the youths of the world. Uh, Digiday's Work Life News highlighted a report from HP called Hybrid Work, Are We There Yet? In, in large part, it was, it was about hybrid working, but Work Life noted a couple findings in the report that indicated that younger workers appear to maybe not be as tech savvy or tech confident, at least, uh, as we thought they would be about all things tech in the way older workers assume. Yeah, so HP surveyed 10,000 office workers in 10 markets around the world. 20% of those aged 18 through 29 said that they felt judged when experiencing technical issues compared to 4% of those older than 40. Also, 25% of that 18 to 29-year-old group said that they would avoid participating in a meeting if they felt like their use of tech would disrupt it, as in not working properly. Compare that to 6% of those Older than 40. <laughs> HP grouped the findings under the heading Tech Shame. Tech Shame. Yikes. Uh, the conclusion that a lot of folks draw from this is that the tech skills people get from growing up with technology are not necessarily the same ones needed in the workplace. Seems logical. Uh, making a TikTok doesn't necessarily make you better at making a PowerPoint or operating a Zoom call. Uh, plus, older folks can afford better equipment and better internet connections in work from home situations. They, you know, that can give them a leg up as well. Scott, do you know? Notice this with your own Gen Z kids? Uh, yeah. So my son, who's 22 now, just turned 22 this year, he definitely shows signs of this. <clears throat> I think part of it is he just showed up and it was all in fruition mode. Like he, when he was eight or nine, Minecraft just existed. Uh, he was a thing you could just jump into and have. He didn't see all the steps it took to get to something like Minecraft, nor did he see what it took to get to something like a small device in your pocket with a touchscreen. He came up with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, uh, I think that he just didn't see the underpinning <clears throat> the way that we did. We saw it from its inception, and it's really kind of dirty implementation of the old days of either the Internet or other technologies. And then we went from using our rotary phones all the way up till now, and we remember every little stage of what it meant in that transition. And I just don't think they have the... The, the the background on it they just see it as what it is and and it's the same way i see a lot of things like i look at a a broken furnace or something mm -hmm. and i just go i don't know like who's gonna take care of this but my dad <laughs> he'd have had it done in five minutes so uh i think there's a little bit of that going on and you know I'm, i don't think it's detrimental in terms of like this is a real gonna be a huge issue i think there's a lot of catch-up that can be done but i think some of us xers and gen uh, uh millennials and so on could be a little nicer you know, to, the, to these up and coming kids and just not assume that because they grew up a touchscreen, somehow they're going to be little tech geniuses. I think that'll help. Well, and so much of the conversation is like, oh, well, but the younger, you know, like you're talking about with your son, you know, in Minecraft, it's like the younger kids just don't know a world where this didn't exist. So they're just so much better at it. And, yeah. you know, there there is a under the hood type of thing going on yeah where it's like well do you know how to you know build your own pc uh well, probably not but there are a lot of people that are uh, over the age of 40 that can't do that either but i think i think there is a little bit more of a nuts and bolts thing that maybe the younger set just has never had to deal with I mean, it's it's not new for older generations to misunderstand what younger generations are are good at. So I, I look at yeah. this report and I'm like, yeah, you know what? This 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 makes sense. My uncle Harold was uh, old enough to drive in 1937. You know, when cars were just starting to not be hobbyist things anymore, they were just starting to be regular things. So of course, he loved collecting cars and he knew how every single one of them worked because he had grown up in an era where you needed to. There wasn't a mm -hmm. cheap mechanic around every corner like there is now i'm not like that even if i do know how to do something on a car i might not because you know i'll i'll spend my time more efficiently doing something else and and just paying somebody to to change that oil or, or work on those brakes so it's it's similar to that and i think it's a good reminder that oh we're, we're tech is, has been a booming long enough that there are folks like like scott's son who ha haven't been forced to go in and edit the text files of civilization in order to make the king of France say something else. Yeah. Also, yeah, go ahead. shout out to the 18 to 29 year olds who don't participate in the calls if their setup <laughs> is going to distract from the calls. Yeah. Because, like, we've all been on the call with, with Bird yeah. over the counting who's like walking through the subway or something and there's a cement mixer <laughs> running next to him. Some guy's cutting concrete. It's, <laughs> I, I don't want to hear that. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah it's a either. it's a good good uh, good uh, self awareness uh, indicator there. Uh, but I can tell you that like I'm working with him on stuff like his computer's not working or he's got some problem with the way uh, I don't know the way emails coming to him or something. These these things come up and he contacts me in the way my mom contacts me and asks me about it. And part of it I can hear in his voice this mm -hmm. feeling of like I don't know because they didn't really tell us. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm not uh, this is I'm not trying to parlay this conversation into a big uh, condemnation of the educational system. But I am saying that because they just got to skip over all of that hard knock life, they don't know what ICQ is. They just know their phones right. work like they don't know. So I again, I return to this idea. Of we've got to figure out a way to be kinder to them because they're just going to feel bad all the well, time. I I think one way to look at it is that technology used to mean a certain set of skills around computers mostly, right? Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And it now means everything. Everybody has a supercomputer in their pocket for the most part, right? Uh, everyone has at least, you know, the ability to visit a library and get access to the internet. Most people have it in their homes, even if it's just through their phone. So take technology out of this conversation. Take, just take the, the technology out of it and, and you get... Uh, new workers often feel judged by their older workers and are worried that things are going to go wrong. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I felt exactly that way. Not necessarily about technology, but about other stuff when I was first entering, you know, my first jobs. And yeah. that's that's just the uh, the way it goes. And back to what Scott's saying about, you know, just be nicer to the new folks, help mentor yep. them. Yep. I uh, remember my dad trying to make me learn how to change the oil in my car. Uh, we went, we went around that dance for about a decade. And finally I was like, I will never do this ever. <laughs> I will pay it, huh? whatever someone wants me to pay them to do this for me. Thank sure. you. Still don't know how to do it. <laughs> All right. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman uh, has another story out. Gurman, very good with this stuff. Uh, so he he's right more, well, more often than, than he's wrong. And Gurman's sources are saying that Apple engineers are working on changes to iOS to support alternative app stores and sideloading in iOS 17. The work is supposedly being done in advance of the EU's Digital Markets Act, a.k.a. DMA, which applies to tech companies with at least 45 million monthly users and a market valuation of at least 75 billion euros. So the big tech companies. Among other things, the act requires these companies to let users install third-party apps on their operating systems by March 6th, 2024. The DMA also requires messaging apps with large user bases to interoperate. So if you're like, oh, it's that one, the one that makes text messaging, you know, work with each other and WhatsApp and all that, that's the DMA. Since the DMA only applies to Europe, though, German points out that Apple might only implement these changes for European customers unless other countries also implement similar regulations, which could happen. So nothing's been announced by Apple officially, but German sources do say Apple is considering mandating security requirements for third-party apps to run on iOS and possibly requiring verification by Apple, which would then carry a fee. Apple also may open its APIs to uh, have access to cameras, NFC, locating devices. Third-party browser makers may also be allowed to use engines other than WebKit. The company has apparently not decided how it intends to comply with the DMA's requirement to allow third-party payment systems in apps yet. Uh, right now, Apple lets some media apps include a link uh, to the web for payment info. Uh, Netflix can do that. Uh, it allows some actual third-party payment options for developers in South Korea and just for dating apps in the Netherlands because the Netherlands forced them to do it for dating apps. In those last two cases, Apple still takes a slightly smaller cut of the payments as well, even if it doesn't go through the App Store, and requires the apps to show warning pop-ups. Apple also has not made a decision yet on how to let iMessage interoperate with the other messaging platforms like WhatsApp, but German sources say it is not going to consider RCS, which might be what you were thinking uh, if you're like, hey, that's the carrier standard for multimedia messaging. It's what Google has been bashing Apple over the head to use. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's on the menu for whatever reason. Will, what do you think this, if this all ends up being true and, and they, they do, uh, even if it's just in Europe, allow third-party payments uh, in, in or third-party apps to sideload, what, what do you think this could mean for Apple's App Store? 
I mean, I think the the my first thought is that Apple is going to want to dissuade users from doing this. So I think the big thing that's going to hit most, you know, side loading is usually a really small percentage of the market. So we're talking probably single digits unless there's some incredible app that comes out that's only side loaded. I think the big thing is that it's going to cause Apple to ch maybe change the way they moderate apps on the existing app store to limit some of the stuff to to allow some of the stuff that's previously been disallowed and is marginal, like you know, hmm. support for X Cloud apps and uh, things like you know maybe Fortnite. Will be back on the App Store because they don't want to give people a, a, an excuse to go out and, and get out of their ecosystem and increase the support costs for their devices. I mean, it would be kind of a, a fun situation if if Apple has won the case, Epic's in the middle of paying for an appeal, and they just were like, "Here, you can, <laughs> you can do third third party payments." Yeah, you know? I was thinking about that very thing because this is all very interesting timing, and and literally could do that. Like, it could end up just making that entire court fight expensive and mean nothing in the end but um i'm interested to see what it means for potentially third-party app stores and what those look like like is a third-party app store some complete other brand that says uh hey we're making like is it good old games compared to steam or the epic store compared to steam on pcs i'm trying to think of other mm -hmm, equivalents mm -hmm. of these alternatives Itch is the other big one right yeah, yeah, yeah. And the idea the idea of that happening isn't crazy on PC, obviously, because it's a close it's an open system and Steam is not demanding people stay anywhere or locking people out of computers. They don't have that power. But in this case, this puts the iPhone closer to what certainly what Android is and even closer to what PCs are in terms of its ecosystem. And what do those look like? Could they could we see like a really cool app store pop up that carries a lot of the same apps we're getting anyway, but also has some other advantages? Uh, maybe even for gamers, uh, could Netflix have their own app store to help bolster their game thing, but also do apps like it gets kind of complicated and weird. And I don't know how many people will belly up to the bar for it, but that's a fascinating landscape. And I, I'm kind of here for it. I want to see what that is. And, and the more widely used operating system already has it. Uh, Android. Right, right. So if you look at that, what what that tells you, and it could be different on iOS, uh, is that you'll get Amazon's App Store, which that'd be fascinating if there was an Amazon iOS App Store. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you'll get some some fun niche app stores out there that that you can you can sideload as well, and that would be be fun as well. I think Wash in the Wind in our chat room has a really interesting thought. What if Google brought the Play Store to iOS? Oh man. Mm. I mean, they could. Why, it wouldn't, why? They wouldn't be able to necessarily port all the Android apps, but what if they operated a, a, an alternative app store on iOS? It'd be interesting. Sure. Sure. Well, and pres presumably developers are still going to have to be Apple developers and yep. do all the normal agreements there to be able to package the apps for, for delivery on whatever right. store to the devices. I, I think it's really interesting. On Android, it seems like the most of the market that's doing sideloading is people buying devices that have non-Google app stores, though. So like things like Amazon Kindle tablets and, and stuff right. like that. Not you and I sideloading apps onto our Android devices. Yeah, that's a, that, that is the good point. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about something we're talking about on the show, but you don't know our email address, let me fix that right now. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Email us. <laughs> Will, you have a long history of testing and reviewing PC components, and you recently had a blog post about upgrading your PC on the PC World build stream. Uh, I like how you described your old machine as a ship of Theseus. You just replaced so many parts over the years. It was not the same PC you started with. Uh, so I get why you wanted to start over fresh. Uh, if we went over every piece of the upgrade, it might take as long as watching the new Avatar movie. So we're going to focus <laughs> just on the main parts, uh, starting with the CPU. What did you choose? Yeah, so, so when Gordon and Adam over at PC World asked me if I wanted to come in and build a PC with them, they at first were like, hey, what CPU do you want? I, and I said, literally, I this was before the new CPUs came out, the new Ryzen and, and Core CPUs came out. And I, I said I didn't know. Like, I, I have some really unusual use cases. I podcast, I play games, I work in an Unreal Engine a fair amount. Um, but I don't do a lot of heavy multi-core tasks anymore. And when the benchmarks came in for the new CPUs, we kind of got down to it and we're like, okay, so you need occasional spikes because you occasionally will, you know, compress a video, compress some audio, something that we use a lot of threads. But for the most part, you want fast, single, dual, maybe quad core performance. And and Gordon at PC World recommended the the Intel processors in that in that case because they spike higher, uh, but but uh, for low core low core counts, but. Uh, they they aren't quite as fast if you're like hitting all of the cores constantly as as the Ryzen's are. All right, uh, let's talk about the motherboard. What'd you go with there? So uh, 
my case is white. I like white cases. I like white computer hardware. So one of the requirements I gave Adam when he was picking out parts was was like, hey, the, you know, see if you find a white motherboard. That would be cool. And I didn't realize <laughs> quite what a challenging thing that was because there's only like seven of them on the market for the new processors. <laughs> uh, the the Asus ROG Maximus Z790 Apex is a LGA1700 motherboard. It's a DDR5 board, and it's primarily for overclockers. Um, but it also uh, has a couple of interesting features. One of them is a uh, there's an additional PCI Express power connector on the leading edge of the board where like the SATA ports and and all of that stuff are. And when you plug your power supply into that, it turns the front mounted USB C port into a 60 watt power supply USB PD power supply. So you can charge your laptop or your Steam Deck or like an iPad off of that at, at full speed, which is nuts. Like I. I when they when they described the feature to me, I was like, "This is a really goofy feature. I'm never going to do this." And then, 15 minutes after I had the the thing turned on, I had plugged a Steam Deck into it, and I was like, "Oh, it's charging at full speed. This is really nice." Um, <laughs> the the other thing that's awesome about it is it only has two RAM slots, slots, which sounds like a negative, but we wanted high speed memory in this, like really high speed DDR5 memory, because that uh, Unreal Engine games, which I work on on my day job are really dependent on uh, memory bandwidth performance typically. And so having high refresh, high, high speed memory uh, in force in a fourth slot configuration is less likely to work reliably than it is if you put it in a two slot configuration. Even having just unpopulated RAM slots that you're not using makes the CPU the system less stable. And and then also having you know higher clock speeds and all that stuff makes the system less stable. So the two slot board seemed like the right way to go in this case and uh and it's worked out really well so far I booted up the first time uh the machine's been running at ddr5 7600 which is not quite the fastest ram you can get but it's really close and we ha i haven't had any uh, stability problems or performance problems or anything like that uh, out of the gate so yeah I, I loved your description of being dismissive of that front uh pcie port and then when you used it going okay actually that <laughs> that's kind of cool yeah but yeah it, it just seems like a goofy thing like why yeah I don't need. I don't. I'm never gonna. Maybe I plug my phone in. Who knows? It's where the gamepad gets plugged in or something. So yeah, it's it's a it's a surprisingly useful feature. I hope you see it. I hope you see it on more boards in the future. Yeah, it's a it's a classic case of of not understanding what what a feature is good for until you actually get a chance to use it. I try try to remind myself of that sort of thing uh, often. Uh, all right, let's get to the new GPU. What'd you what'd you pick? Well, so I reviewed the 4090s from NVIDIA a few months ago when they when they rolled them out. And uh, so I had one laying around, and I, I just took that in with me. We chucked that in there because we figured might as well see what happens. It turns out it's really fast. Um, the, the, the new uh, AMD GPUs, the RDNA 3 GPUs, aren't out yet at the time we did the build last week. And the 4080 seems like kind of a fizzle in terms of price to performance. Like they, it seems like Nvidia may have overpriced it a little bit over over what they should have for the for the the speed that the card's capable of. And you're you're almost always better off spending a few hundred bucks more on the 4090 if you're going to spend a thousand dollars plus on a GPU. Um, the the RDNA boards seem really interesting. There've been a lot of rumors about performance this week, but the uh, unfortunately the embargoes on that stuff aren't up yet, so we don't we don't have real official benchmarks yet. When when you get real official benchmarks. Uh, would you even consider revisiting this option, uh, or 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 are you happy enough with the forty ninety RTX? That I, I think I could probably settle for the forty ninety R. No, no. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, so the the AMD cards are uh, priced somewhere on. It seems like they're going to sandwich the forty eighty based on the the rumors that we've seen. Mm -hmm. so we'll see one that's slightly faster, one that's slightly slower. It seems like the forty ninety is going to remain the the kind of top dog for this generation from from what we've seen, unless unless AMD has a last minute surprise. And, and like we said, uh, Will's got a whole blog post on this. There's a PC World build stream. Uh, but but to finish out here, uh, tell us what you did with storage. Yeah, so um, Adam, when he was specking this, I was like, hey, we're just going to put a bunch of NVMe SSDs in the, here. Is this OK with you? And I said, yeah, I, I'm fine with that. Um, we went with the two uh, two SK Hynix Platinum 40, P41 two terabyte drives, and then one Solidime P44 Pro that's a little bit faster than those. And um, what I did was I set up the C drive on the Solidime, uh, the, the slightly faster drive, and then I've got a big data uh, partition on uh, spread across those other two drives, so that I I actually can like I have a data structure for the first time that doesn't have an old folder on it that says stuff from C, which is what every computer I've had for the last 20 years has had on it. So I, I, I redesigned my storage and backup processes for this for this new machine. We talked about it on the TechPod this week, uh, which was which people seem to really enjoy. So if, if you're curious about what the approach was there, you can, you can check that out. 
Did you install a gas generator or solar panels to power your <laughs> NVIDIA or how are you dealing with that? I don't don't tell Gordon because he'll be really upset with me, but I've undervolted almost everything just a little bit because it turns out it's fast enough. So, yeah. It's fast enough. You, you can always go back if you need it later. Yeah, if I need, need that juice, it's there. All right. Uh, Sarah, you thirsty? <laughs> I sure am. I'm not only thirsty, but I'm wondering what to do over the holidays with my loved ones. Uh, oh. And if you're also wondering that, you might like this next story. Hard seltzer beverage company White Claw and Netflix have somehow banded together for a limited edition murder mystery tabletop game called Crack the Claw. It's available for a limited purchase now. Also has official rules, a moderator script, 10 double-sided coasters that correspond with things like player roles, mo like moderator, vacationers, doctor, detective, and who's the murderer. <sighs> Player players can pair this game with a white claw of their choice, I guess. <laughs> John Shea, who's Not included. The Chief, yeah, yeah. Chief Marketing Officer of White Claw USA, yes, White Claw is sold separately, said in an interview that the game is fun and engaging. Oh, well, I'm glad. Oh, man. The uh, more White Claws you drink, the more fun it is. <laughs> the more fun and engaging it gets. That's how it uh, works. So it's mafia. It's a mafia game. That's fine. You know, I like a good mafia game. A little, little Among Us vibe, right? You know, you know, there are White Claw fans, and I'm, you know, I, why not? Who's I'll do it. The murderer? I don't sure. totally know how Netflix gets involved in this, but they have. That is the weird bit. This reminds me of like the 90s and everything Red Bull was doing with everything. Everybody had a deal with Red Bull. And uh -huh. this just feels like, oh, yeah. White Claw Netflix. That's just weird enough. I guess that works, sort of. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't knock Flugtog, Scott. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> they I've they never. allowed a man to jump from the edge of space to the, to the, to the ground. Yeah, that's right. Um, Gotta yeah, crack the I claw, guys. Had no idea that Netflix would get into not just video games, but tabletop games as well. Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of fun. Well, once for... the claws come out, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> claws yeah, out. Yeah. Claws nice. out. Claws nice. at the wall. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Paul. Paul says, since there's been so much talk on the show recently about machine learning content generators like chat, GPT, and terms of services, or TOSs, I had a thought. Why not combine the two? Maybe a chat GPT like AI could be used to digest a term of service. Then you could ask the AI to do things like give me the top five most important points from this TOS or how does this TOS affect my privacy rights? Paul says, of course, there would probably have to be legal ramifications about how accurate the AI is since chat GPT is still prone to simple errors, but it could provide a solution to unreadable TOSs. You know what? This doesn't solve the biggest problem that we were talking about on this topic, which is why TOSs are the way they are, like why we can't have a better system for this. But I like what Paul's saying is like, until we do figure all of that out, uh, here's a way that that maybe it could help you figure things out without having to rely on somebody else. Uh, need a lot of training, need a lot of vetting, you know, before somebody could, could provide this in a way that you could rely on. But I, I like the idea. I think there's something there. Yeah, I do too. There's so much doom and gloom about AI the, in the moment in my circles anyway. A lot of artists are really upset. There's that whole mess at art station. There's a lot of weirdness going on. Hmm. But I like when the conversation turns to creative uses of the technology, which is here to stay and it's going to keep growing. So we may as well start figuring out cool ways to use it. And this is a pretty good one. I can't tell you the last time I read a whole TOS, which I think was never. I don't think I've ever done it. <laughs> I've tried. So, <laughs> I've, tried. I've tried too. I really, I really tried yeah. once. I went, Valiantly. you know what? I'm going to do mm -hmm. this because I'm going to be a smart consumer. I got like two paragraphs in, realized there were nine left, and I went, I'm not, I'm done. I'm out. We did a segment on Tested briefly that was like, hey, here's what the TOS means. And we had to stop doing it because nobody wanted to read the TOSs. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. let it's the machines do it. It's not the yeah. most fun research. Yeah. No, no. Machine yeah. learning. This is this is where it's at. The only TOS I've read is the original series. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, oh, also, KT Data point out out in our chat room uh, that you know the Netflix White Claw Crack the Claw game is related to the Glass Onion movie, which is a Knives Out movie. So if, if, if I thought we mentioned that, but in case we didn't, yes, that ah. is that is part of the reason that that is coming out. Gotcha. Um, well, a uh, great reason for us to do the show is having Will Smith joining us on the show. Thanks so much for being here, Will, and let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, you can find me at uh, techpod.content.town, which is where uh, it's the internet home of Brad and Will made a techpod. Uh, also on that site is the FossPod, which is our free and open source software thing. And then I'm on Twitch at twitch.tv slash notthatwillsmith. 
among other places. Excellent. Scott Johnson, so nice to have you as well. Let folks know where you ca they can keep up with your latest. Well, thank you, Sarah. I, I love being on Wednesdays. And when I'm here, I always like to let people know maybe one or two cool things going on. Well, one cool thing that just uh, happened for me is I revived an old show that I put on hiatus while we waited for you know more to talk about. And that is The Diablo Show. Yes, that's right. A show entirely dedicated to the video game Diablo. And uh, I really love doing it when I did it. I'm really happy that there's so much more stuff to talk about now. And we got a brand new game coming in the form of Diablo 4. So if that sounds interesting to you and you like that game or that series, you want to get into the lore of the whole thing and the news and all the other stuff around it, check out that show at frogpants.com slash Diablo or find it right now wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to Rob O. Rob O is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Rob, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you for all the years of support. Yeah, Rob's probably got some of that patron loyalty merch, uh, being being a supporter for so long. Uh, you can get that too. Patreon.com slash DTNS. New nine-year anniversary logo from Len Peralta. Clock started last week. Uh, so if you sign up now, or if you're already signed up, uh, in three months, you'll get the first of those Patreon merch rewards. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, which we roll into right after DTNS concludes. But just a reminder, you can catch this show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>